3. The Death of the Savior. The sufferings of the Savior finally culminated in his death. In connection with this the following points should be emphasized. a. The extent of his death. It is but natural that, when we speak of the death of Christ in this connection, we have in mind first of all physical death, that is, the separation of body and soul. At the same time we should remember that this does not exhaust the idea of death as it is represented in Scripture. The Bible takes a synthetic view of death and regards physical death merely as one of its manifestations. Death is separation from God, but this separation can be viewed in two different ways. Man separates himself from God by sin, and death is the natural result, so that it can even be said that sin is death. But it was not in that way that Jesus became subject to death, since he had no personal sin. In this connection it should be borne in mind that death is not merely the natural consequence of sin, but above all the judicially imposed and inflicted punishment of sin. It is God's withdrawing. himself with the blessings of life and happiness from man and visiting man. In wrath. It is from this judicial point of view that the death of Christ must be considered. God imposed the punishment of death upon the mediator judicially, since the latter undertook voluntarily to pay the penalty for the sin of the human race. Since Christ assumed human nature with all its weaknesses, as it exists after the fall, and thus became like us in all things, sin only accepted. It follows that death worked in him from the very beginning and manifested itself in many of the sufferings to which he was subject. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The Heidelberg Catechism correctly says that all the time he lived on earth, but especially at the end of his life, he bore, in body and soul, the wrath of God against the sin of the whole human race. 37 Quetzales. These sufferings were followed by his death on the cross. But this was not all, he was subject not only to physical, but also to eternal death, though he bore this intensively. And not extensively, when he agonized in the garden and when he cried. Out on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In a short period of time he bore the infinite wrath against sin to the very end and came out victoriously. This was possible for him only because of his exalted nature. At this point we should guard against misunderstanding, however. Eternal death in the case of Christ did not consist in an abrogation of the union of the Logos with the human nature, nor in the divine nature's being forsaken of God, nor in the withdrawal of the Father's divine love or good pleasure from the person of the Mediator. The Logos remained united with the human nature even when the body was in the grave, the divine nature could not possibly be forsaken of God, and the person of the Mediator was and ever continued to be the object of divine favor. It revealed itself in the human consciousness of the mediator as a feeling of Godforsakenness. This implies that the human nature for a moment missed the conscious comfort which it might derive from its union with the divine logos, and the sense of divine love, and was painfully conscious of the fullness of the divine wrath which was bearing down upon it. Yet there was no despair, for even in the darkest hour, while he exclaims that he is forsaken, he directs his prayer to God. b. The judicial character of his death. It was quite essential that Christ should die neither a natural nor an accidental death, and that he should not die by the hand of an assassin, but under a judicial sentence. He had to be counted with the transgressors, had to be condemned as a criminal. Moreover, it was providentially arranged by God that he should be tried and sentenced by a Roman judge. The Romans had a genius for law and justice, and represented the highest judicial power in the world. It might be expected that a trial before a Roman judge would serve to bring out clearly the innocence of Jesus, which it did, so that it became perfectly clear that he was not condemned for any crime which he had committed. It was a testimony to the fact that, as the Lord says, he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people, to whom the stroke was due. And when the Roman judge nevertheless condemned the innocent, he, it is true, also condemned himself and human justice as he applied it. But at the same time imposed sentence on Jesus as the representative of the highest judicial power in the world, functioning by the grace of God and dispensing justice in God's name. The sentence of Pilate was also the sentence of God, though on entirely different grounds. It was significant too that Christ was not beheaded or stoned to death. Crucifixion was not a Jewish, but a Roman form of punishment. 
It was accounted so infamous and ignominious that it might not be applied to Roman citizens, but only to the scum of mankind, to the meanest criminals and slaves. By dying that death, Jesus met the extreme demands of the law. At the same time he died an accursed death, and thus gave evidence of the fact that he became a curse for us. Deuteronomy 21 verse 23, Galatians 3 verse 13.